Universitat Regensburg, 1982. On the morning of 14th June, 1982, the staff opened the doors to begin their work week. It's a Monday, and this week they have just taken receipt of 56 octopi caught off the Gulf of Naples. Each octopus is given its own bucket, a place to call home while they await whatever experiments are planned for. They are not going to make it that far. The staff walk in on a bloodbath. Except there is no blood visible, not anywhere. Only a thick mounting foam of protein churning on the surface of each bucket, broken only by chunks of octopus meat, connected by the finest threads of sinew to entire arms floating freely. Bite marks as clear as day indicate where each arm has been torn from its base by sharp and ravenous beaks. None of these octopi are spared. And why would they be? They were the ones that did this to themselves. Six days after being transferred into this new environment, each and every octopus had folded its arms inward in a way it would never normally do. It had reached over with its beak so as to get as much of the meat as possible to fit. Arm trembling, twitching uncontrollably, each octopus bites down, severing nerve connections and slicing through the flesh. But the cut, though deep, is not yet complete. The octopus continues chewing, thoughtfully almost, contorting itself so it can excise as much of the base as possible. The arm is no longer part of it, must not be part of it. It has to be. For most of the octopi, only one arm is severed, which is already enough to cause death. One in five cannot stop at one, however. These buckets have two floating arms, sometimes three, four, and in one case, six. Some of these arms are whole, and others partially eaten. And then, the scientists make one more discovery. They realize that some of these buckets belong to a separate batch, one delivered months ago, that had never before shown any signs of any problems. The only thing that had changed is that their water had become connected to the water supply of the newly delivered octopi. The octopi that now floated in tatters across the lab. Whatever this is, it spreads. And welcome back to Draw Curiosity, Bio True Crime Edition. We've often heard that octopi are one of the smartest animals on Earth, and that's very true. There are countless instances of octopi escaping from any containment they have, solving puzzles, opening jars, the list goes on. And there is something about the way they move and interact with the world that just seems to resonate with us humans on a very emotional level. They also have an unusually short lifespan for such an intelligent animal. Octopi are what are known as semelparous animals. Semel meaning once, paris meaning bearing offspring, meaning that both males and females reproduce only once in their lives. But instead of just entering a period of terminal celibacy, the octopi actually take it one step further. To ensure that this act of childmaking is their first and last, the octopus destroys its own body soon after fertilization. When a mother octopus lays her eggs, she guards them and cleans them, and most importantly, stops feeding. Weeks pass and the mother never once leaves her children's side. Her body thins out and her skin goes pale. The flesh around her eyes recedes so much that they appear sunken. And by the time the hatchlings break out into the world, most of them are orphans. The fathers don't do much better, entering the same process after they are done mating, which is also known as senescence. Within months, they too weaken, stop feeding, and fade into nothing. You could say that octopi have a built-in kill switch, and it turns out that statement is more accurate than science fiction would have us believe. All of this behavior can be traced back to a single endocrine gland, the optic gland. Located between and slightly behind the octopus's eyes, researchers have found that removing the optic gland lets the octopus live for up to six months longer. Half a lifetime for some of these specimens, in full defiance of the semelparous nature. The optic glands in an octopus act similarly to the pituitary glands in humans, controlling the octopus's hormones and metabolism. 
In 2018, the genes expressed in the optic gland were sequenced at different stages of a female octopus's lifespan, revealing high levels of expression of genes that inhibit feeding patterns both physically and behaviorally after mating. They detected an elevated expression of IMPL2, a protein that has been shown to induce tissue wasting and degradation in flies. In 2022, the same research group found that higher levels of steroids were also produced, implying that many of the systems beyond these two are influenced during brooding. The accumulation of 7-DHC, which is observed in octopi, is also linked to developmental disorders in humans, such as smith lemley oppitz syndrome, which is characterized by a broad spectrum of symptoms, including self-injury, like in octopi. All this generated from one self-destruct switch. So why is it so important for the octopus to die before her children are born? Well, for one, an octopus will quite cheerfully eat another octopus. It's almost like they know they're tasty. Octopi also are capable of growing to massive sizes with no ceiling other than the availability of food around them. In many ways, the survival of the adult octopus is in direct competition with the existence of any future generations. Reproducing only once also ensures that an organism invests as much energy as possible into one large reproductive event, maximizing the number of offspring that are produced and the number of offspring that will actually make it through. It's just that in the case of the octopus, the maximum possible energy it can invest includes any life it might have after her children are born. But none of this explains the outbreak that I talked about earlier. In the summer of 1982, None of the Regensburg octopi had mated, and there were males and females alike. From the logs. Some animals fed regularly until the day before autophagy started, whereas other animals stopped feeding two days before. Of the 50 cases recorded, all animals died within one to five days after the onset of autophagy. Of those, 80% died within one day. Over the next three years, several other populations of octopi brought into the university ended up cannibalizing themselves in the same way, before stopping in January 1985. The behavior was never observed again. In most cases, autophagy took place between the 6th and 17th day after being transported over. The seawater was tested before and after the incidents, and nothing was ever found to be different. The scientist also tested the brains of the octopi and found no obvious changes or anomalies in the structure of any of the brain lobes. The only thing that could be concluded is that some agent, whether bacterial or chemical, was triggering this. It had incubated for one to two weeks and it had been introduced by the octopi transported from Naples, infecting the entire lab's population through the shared water system, bypassing every filter that had been put in place. It is a known fact that octopi in captivity may harm themselves in similar ways when hungry, stressed, or in a tank lacking suitable enrichment for them. However, this is distinct from the phenomenon of contagious autophagy that I'm describing here. The true terror of octopus keepers is for self-cannibalization to happen, as it is a known death sentence to all other octopi sharing the same water. There appears to be no easy solution to prevent its spread, and the main recommended wisdom is to judiciously clean the tank and scrub it free of all contaminants. Otherwise, the next octopus to enter the tank will still fall to the same fate. These recommendations are informed by the actions taken by the Regensburg lab in May 1983, after saying goodbye to two entire populations of octopi. They took two preventative measures, keeping animals in quarantine for two to three weeks before transfer into the closed seawater system, and also setting their protein skimmers to high performance for the first two to three weeks, replacing around 5% of seawater with fresh artificial seawater every single day. Though no detailed studies have been performed to assess the effectiveness of these measures, there were no cases of autophagy since then. So whatever it was that was happening, never spread to another octopi again at Regensburg University. So what is the agent that caused this mass autophagy? Whatever it is, demonstrated clear infectious traits. The existing population of octopi in the lab at the time had already been established for several months with no signs of anything wrong, which only changed when the new population of octopi was introduced. This clearly points to something that could spread from one animal to another. The octopi had not had any contact with each other, not even sight. Their only contact was through the shared seawater system, 
Thus, the infectious agent must have spread through water. Despite this, there has been no finding of a potential cause. No bacteria, fungus, protist or virus has been identified that could be held responsible for this infectious behaviour. There is also speculation whether it could be some form of prion, a misfolded protein that exhibits infectious properties. Famous prion diseases that you may have heard of are kudu and mad cow disease, where the consumption of that misfolded protein causes the misfolding of other proteins that it comes into contact with, with fatal consequences. My personal hunch is that it may be the release of a hormone or something similar that triggers the cascade of the expression of genes that are in the optic gland. Since multiple systems are disproportionately affected by the activity of the optic gland, some sort of hormone or other signaling molecule in the water could have set off the self-cannibalizing pathways of the octopus that are normally only seen at the end of its life, such as the 7-DHC pathway that we talked about earlier. However, to date, there are no studies nor evidence that can neither prove nor disprove this. The clearest early symptom that an animal was going to bite off one or more of its arms, usually the following day, was uncoordinated, unstable, and to various degrees, trembling arm movements. There were no other signs. To this day, no cause has been found for the contagious self-cannibalism in Regensburg between 1982 and 1985. The mystery remains unsolved. But what kind of substance could this contagious agent be? If one octopus's dying mind releases a storm of molecules into the water, stress hormones and broken steroid fragments, could those signals seep into another brain and whisper, end it too? I really hope you enjoyed today's mystery Halloween piece. Thank you so much for watching all the way until the end. As always, I do have a bunch of announcements, so if you miss me, feel free to stick around. First of all, I know it's Halloween, but I've made Christmas merch and I'll have you know this is the first time I have ever made merch. I have been on the internet for well over 10 years, I've never made merch before, but I finally did it. So if you want to support my channel and have whimsical and punny Christmas merch, uh, you can find mugs, apparel, I have t-shirts, hoodies, long sleeve, stickers. You can find all of those on my fourth world shop and you're probably seeing me open them right now because I literally got the boxes today so you're going to be the first to see me open these. But we have a Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año y Felicidad. And we also have a Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. And I drew both of these myself, so they are exclusive merch uh, for this channel. They are going to be just available until the Christmas season is over. So if you like whimsical Christmas things and you want to support my channel, feel free to check it out. Um, it will be on my fourth wall shop and I'll have a link on screen. Right now I just have it embedded in fourth wall, but I'm figuring out a way to get it on my own website. So I uh, would love it if you checked that out. If you miss me and you want to support my work and get more extra behind the scenes and Insta360 content, you can support me on Patreon. You can also subscribe to YouTube memberships, but honestly, Patreon gives me a slightly better cut, so I would do the Patreon version. Uh, and finally, if you really, really miss me and you want to see more of me, I have been streaming on Twitch three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, starting at midday, Los Angeles, Pacific time. So if you enjoy live content, feel free to tune in there. It's twitch.tv forward slash draw curiosity. I do a little bit of everything. So we do science, we do art, I build Legos, I play games. You'll probably learn something. So if you enjoy the energy here, but you want something that's a little more laid back and a little more often, would also be great if you wanted to come up over there. As always, I want to say thank you so much to my patrons on Patreon, to my YouTube membership members, and to my Twitch subscribers. Thank you so much for supporting me. It really allows me to do these things, and I am eternally grateful for all of the support that I have received over the years from there. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you so much for watching me. I'll see you in the next one.